invite the Cresselius family to come forward and they're going to have our, our reading and the lighting of the two candles for the second Sunday of Advent. Read now for And they... Do you want me to do it? <laughs> okay, go ahead. In days when God's people longed for peace, Isaiah declared, Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand and hand double for all her sins. Isaiah 41. I am standing up. Okay, we who gather today also seek comfort and peace, yet we are unsatisfied with ideas of peace that tell us to keep quiet and go with the flow. We long for real peace, true peace, just peace. We wait as people who yearn for peace. Peace that bears the fruit of community, equity, equity and flourishing for all. We light these candles as signs of God's shocking help and just peace. May they be beacons calling us to wrap it and live to the good news of Jesus. Christ as we wait and watch a neighbor for the day when all people can gather together to worship and glorify God. Amen. Why no claps? We have three short scripture readings for today uh, from Isaiah chapter 9, from John chapter 14, and also from Philippians chapter 4. But first, may we pray. Eternal Lord, you want to speak to us. You desire to communicate with us. Therefore, open our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say afresh this day. For we ask these prayers in the name of Jesus, the Word of God made flesh. Amen. In honor of God's Word, I invite you to please stand. So Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Our choir could sing sing these words. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And then jumping over to the New Testament, to the Gospel of John. John chapter 14. Martin gave us a preview of this. This is John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And then finally in Philippians, Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. Philippians 4 verse 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is the word of God and you say. Please be seated. The peace The peace of God was promised long ago and now is a reality through the life, 
death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have only four cousins. My cousin who lives down in Houston uh, is married and his wife works for Beth Moore's Living Proof Ministries. Her book, Breaking Free, provides a beautiful description of some of the prophetic words written in the book of Isaiah. She talks about victory and about how to find ultimate peace in a relationship through Jesus Christ. She writes these words. What do you suppose would happen if we paid attention to God's commands? We don't have to wonder because he told us clearly in Isaiah 48 verse 18. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river. Your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Considering the, consider this following uh, application as you imagine peace like a river. A, a river, unlike the Trinity, is a moving stream of water. God's word does not say that we will have peace like a pond. We might admit to thinking that peaceful people are boring. We might think that, oh, I'd rather forgo peace and live an exciting life instead. But few bodies are more exciting than rivers. When was the time that you have seen white water rapids? Maybe a trip to Colorado. We can have active, exciting lives without suffering through a life of turmoil. But to have peace like a river is to have a security, to have a tranquility while meeting many bumps and unexpected turns on life's journey. Peace is submission to a trustworthy authority, not resignation from activity. A river is a body of fresh water fed by streams, fed by uh, springs as well. And to experience peace, we must be feeding on our relationship with God. I can't retain peace in the present while relying on a relationship from the past. As a river is continually renewed through the moving waters of springs and tributary streams, so our peace is an active, ongoing, obedient relationship with the Prince of Peace. This and other Bible references are examples of the ways God desires to feed a peaceful river in your soul. A river begins and ends with a body of water. Every river has an upland source and an ultimate outlet or mouth. Rivers depend on and always are connected to other bodies of water. Similarly, peace like a river flows from a continuous connection with the upland source, that is, Jesus Christ. This observation is a timely reminder that our life will ultimately spill out into a glorious eternal life. The present life is not our destination. We know that Christ moves over the rocks and sometimes of the cliffs through narrow places and wide valleys to a heavenly destination for us. Until then, until heaven, abiding in Christ is the key to staying deliberately connected with our upland source. Take pleasure in knowing that God inspired his word with great care and precision. He chose the words purposefully. And when he said that we could have peace like a river in Isaiah 48, verse 18, he wasn't just drawing some loose analogy. 
Rather, he meant it. So what does it mean to have this type of peace? What does it mean to have this type of peace? Well, attention to God's commands by obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit. Obedience to God's authority not only brings peace like a river, but also righteousness like the waves of the sea. Not righteous perfection, but righteous consistency. Peace is something we all desire, and it is something that God promises to give us. Peace like a river is an active, moving peace. It's not stale or stagnant, it's dynamic and powerful in our lives. Christmas will be a time that reminds us of the arrival of Jesus that brings us deep and abiding peace. The Old Testament prophet named Isaiah wrote our first scripture reading for the people of God who were losing their way and they were definitely in need of hope in finding peace. In Isaiah 9, 6, we find a prophetic promise that predicts the birth of a child, Jesus. This child, Isaiah tells his readers, is described in terms of awe and reference. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, comma, Counselor, comma, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6 is a passage of scripture that is often heard during Christmas time, especially as part of Handel's Messiah. Isaiah 9, 6 provides... Uh, us with a way to uncover the profound significance of the Prince of Peace. Peace, of course, is a timeless concept. Peace is something that humanity has desired uh, throughout the ages, a respite from the storms and conflict and chaos and discord from life. From ancient times all the way up to present day people, people have longed for a sense of the calm, a respite from the chaos of the world. But the peace promised in Isaiah 9 is not an ordinary peace. It is the peace that transcends human understanding. This peace is the peace that comes only from Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. The phrase, the peace that passes all understanding, is shared and spoken over people in times of hardship. Peace that surpasses understanding is simply the peace that our hearts feel when we are in a relationship with Jesus. And what better time that peace during the holidays to celebrate as we journey toward Christmas. The Prince of Peace was prophesied hundreds of years prior to the birth of Jesus. Christmas is a time to celebrate that Jesus has, in fact, arrived. He has brought with him the promise of peace. The promise that in spite of everything that is going on all around us, we can assess or access peace through Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John... We seek uh, to learn about what Jesus had to say to his disciples there in the upper room. And we hear him say this unbelievable message. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let your heart, let not your heart be troubled and neither be afraid. Jesus distinguishes his peace from the fleeting peace that is offered by the world. It is a peace that is grounded in the eternal truths and presence of the Savior. There is a difference between God's peace and the world's peace. God's peace versus the world's peace is an important distinction 
because it's what we celebrate during Advent and Christmas. One form of peace will leave us wanting, and while the other will offer us deep fulfillment. For those of you who are on Facebook or TikTok, have you seen the reels showing people sitting or standing on boulders next to the ocean? And someone, duh, thought it would be a good idea to get all dressed up and poised next to the waves of the ocean. To their surprise, the, the waves crash over, over them and then they drench the person who's being photographed in their good outfit, such as a wedding dress. Now, imagine that you are standing on the shore of a vast, tumultuous sea. The waves crash against the rocks and the waves are choppy. The sea is a metaphor for the world in which we live, a realm of constant motion, uncertainty, and chaos. In this world, we often seek solace and tranquility. We want to find peace amid the storms of life. So in this analogy, worldly peace is like a small boat built by human hands. The boat is meticulously designed with polished wood and gleaming paint and ornate decorations. This boat is beautiful to behold. This boat represents the various avenues society offers us to find peace. These avenues might include material wealth, social status, or temporary pleasures. They are alluring, and they promise moments of respite from the stormy seas. As we embark on this little vessel, the little boat provides a semblance of peace. It shields us from the immediate onslaught of the waves by offering a brief respite from the turmoil of life. We feel a sense of security and control as we believe that we have found the answer to the chaotic sea of life. However, worldly peace is fragile and fleeting. When the storm grows fiercer, the boat begins to sway and to creak under the pressure. Its ornate features start to fade and reveal its weaknesses. And we realize that its capacity to provide lasting peace is limited and unable to withstand the full force of all that life has to throw at us. In stark contrast... God's peace can be understood as a lighthouse standing tall against the crashing waves of the sea. God's lighthouse is sturdy, solid, but it's not as flashy as the beautiful boat. God's lighthouse has a foundation that is unshakable. It is rooted in the solid rock of God's unchanging nature. The light shining from the lighthouse pierces through the darkness by offering guidance and assurance to all who seek it. This lighthouse symbolizes the peace that transcends understanding, a peace, as Martin said, that is not dependent on external circumstances. God's peace is a peace that flows from a deep and abiding relationship with the Prince of Peace, Jesus. Just as the lighthouse stands firm amidst the storm, God's peace remains unwavering in the face of all life's trials that come against us. And as we navigate the seas of life, we are presented with a choice to place our faith and our trust in this little boat of worldly peace or to seek refuge in the steadfast lighthouse of God's peace. The boat might offer a temporary escape, but it ultimately leaves us vulnerable and adrift. On the other hand, God's peace provides a sanctuary of calm amidst life's storms. How? Well, by anchoring us 
in God's unchanging love and sovereignty. In the end, we are invited to exchange the fragile vessel of worldly peace for the enduring refuge of God's peace. God's peace is a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that sustains us through the fiercest storms and trials of life, a peace that leads us safely to the shores of a relationship with the God of the universe who is in charge. With that in mind, may we choose to anchor our lives to the unshakable lighthouse of God's peace by trusting that he will guide us through safely through the storms of life's seas. Jesus told his d- disciples on Monday, Thursday, the night before he died, there in the upper room, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. So let your heart not be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. You probably heard the phrase, do not be afraid, occurs in the Bible. Anybody know how many times? 365, exactly. 365 times. I think it's interesting that there's one of these phrases for each day of the year. So when, as I told the children, when, when Jesus told Told them, don't worry about tomorrow. He already knows that tomorrow there's going to be another do not be afraid. For Jesus is inviting us to trust in him and to enter into an abundant life marked by divine peace. How can we live in peace? In peace with others, in peace with ourselves, and in peace in our relationship with God? Well, our third scripture reading is... Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. First thing that we can do is to recognize the source of our peace. During the the time between when God first called me to become a pastor and the time that I would start seminary. I worked for the city of Denton. We had a manager who would announce at the start of the day, as soon as she arrived, how her day would be according to the music that she heard on the radio on the way to work. If, if she liked the songs that she heard, it was going to be a good day. If she didn't like that, that music, then not so much. Do we take such a tact when it comes to our source of peace? For example, is our peace based on how our day went, how the baby slept? Is our peace based on how the traffic was on the way to work or what the weather it was like. On the other hand, the peace of Jesus Christ is a peace that does not make sense in our normal way of doing things. It guards our hearts and minds. Our hearts, our minds, are two of the most vulnerable parts of who we are. In Isaiah 9, we are reminded that Jesus is the giver of peace. And to live in peace, we must recognize that the ultimate peace originates from him, our upland source. In Philippians 4, 7, we read that the peace of God is found in Christ. It has nothing to do with our worldly possessions and our achievements, but has everything to do with our relationship with Christ. Another way that we find peace that we are craving is by seeking and embracing inner stillness. Jesus gives us access to calm and inner stillness when we draw near to him. The stillness may be achieved by practicing what are called simple uh, breath prayers or journaling. A breath prayer is is a very short prayer that you can say in one breath. Especially when we get through the tough 
or the chaotic, it's helpful to have strategies to calm your inner world and find the peace that Christ offers. Not in ourselves, not in our circumstances, not in our things, but in Christ. We also need to trust God and prioritize prayer. Trust that he is who he says he is. When he says, cast all our care on him because he cares for us. Through prayer, we cast our cares on the one being in the entire universe who can help us in every way with every last problem and anxiety that we have. And that's the good news. Especially in Advent and Christmas season when it can begin to feel like we are, are running around crazy and that we are trying to make every last appointment and to secure every last gift. To experience God's peace, we must spend time with him. And there's no better time than the present to seek the presence of Christ, the Prince of Peace. Caroline was an executive at a large company and took great pride in her work. She was renowned for her efficiency and productivity. Her days were full of meetings and deadlines and appointments and leaving little room for anything else. Caroline was proud of her work accomplishments. And even though she had a very full life, she felt empty. One day, as she hurried off to another important meeting, she noticed a small garden tucked away between two buildings downtown. This sight caught her attention, and she decided to take a quick detour and stepped into that garden. There, she saw the sight that would change her perspective. Amidst the flowers and the buzzing bees, Caroline noticed a single bee that stood out. While the other bees darted from flower to flower in a frenzy, this particular bee seemed different. The bee would land on a flower, stay for a while, and then move on to another one. The bee didn't rush. It savored each moment by collecting nectar with deliberate care. Time itself seemed to slow down in that small little garden. In that moment, Caroline realized that she was one of those frenzied bees by always rushing off to the next thing. She saw a parallel between the bee and her own spiritual life. Caroline had been so absorbed in her career and her daily demands that she had neglected her relationship with God. She had become so spiritually dry, disconnected, and empty. Caroline understood that just as the bee found nourishment and purpose in its unhurried moments with the flowers, she needed to slow down and to prioritize time with God. She needed those moments of stillness, reflection, and communion with her Lord and Savior to truly thrive. From that day forward, Caroline made a commitment to spend quality time with her Heavenly Father each day. She set aside moments for prayer, meditation, and scripture reading. She learned to savor these moments by allowing God's presence to fill her life. As a result, Caroline experienced a transformation of that life. She found a deep sense of peace and contentment that surpassed her career achievements. Her relationships improved and she discovered a greater purpose in her work by aligning it with God's plan for her life. A true story that compares bees might seem lame or silly until we Americans consider that we use the term bees to describe our lives, don't we? Especially in the workplace where we have the worker bees and we have the busy, busy bees and we have the queen bee, right? Caroline's story serves as a reminder that in our fast 
fast-paced world, it's easy to become like the busy bees who rush through life without taking time for the most important relationship of all that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Just as the bee found fulfillment in its deliberate movements that it made with the flowers, we too find fulfillment, purpose, and peace when we prioritize spending time with our Heavenly Father. Living in peace, as outlined in Isaiah uh, chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, and in John 14, 27, is a transformative journey. So living in peace involves recognizing Jesus as the source of peace, embracing our inner tranquility, trusting in God's sovereignty, practicing forgiveness, pursuing holistic well-being, choosing contentment, and prioritizing prayer and meditation. I know that's a lot of things to consider. And I know how many of you probably have some Christmas shopping left to do. But I trust that as you apply these principles in your life, that you will experience a profound and enduring peace that can come only from the Prince of Peace, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. So let us learn from the busy bee and be intentional about slowing down to savor the moments that we have with God. In those unhurried moments, we find nourishment, guidance, and also purpose that our souls truly crave. For in those moments, we can truly enjoy the greatest gift of all, that is the gift of Emmanuel, God with us. May we pray. Eternal Lord, so often, O oh Lord, we are so busy that we don't slow down to notice you. We don't prioritize prayer. And we don't make an, an effort to spend each day with you. So forgive us, O oh God. Show us how we might incorporate quiet times in our lives, how we might slow down and focus on you. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you help us to experience your peace, an abiding peace. For we are thankful that you sent your son, Jesus, as the Prince of Peace. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.